Three hours, 48 minutes, and 34 seconds ago, Apollo 10 blasted off from pad 39B at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And now, astronauts John Stafford and John Young and uh, Eugene, uh, Tom Stafford, John Young, Eugene Cernan, are on their way to the moon. They've gone through the first critical stage, the blast off, the second critical stage, orbital insertion around the Earth, the third critical stage, translunar injection, that is, getting out of Earth orbit and into the flight toward the moon. And they have now docked with the lunar module and are uh, preparing to withdraw it. The ejection, it is called, and that is supposed to come uh, about, uh, oh, 58, I can hardly see my clock from here, but it's about 20 minutes from now. Arthur C. Clarke, man, I'm proud to call my friend and a fellow who all of you space buffs have read uh, from uh, long before the days when we put our first man into suborbital flight, uh, dreaming and projecting uh, the days when man would be flying uh, around the world in spaceships as one of the world's great science writers. Arthur, uh, when did you write your first uh, science fiction piece about uh, space flight, rocket flight? Well, I worked out this morning. It's about 35 years ago. 35 years ago. I think I saw my first articles on space flight around about 1936. Now, I've, I've heard uh, you fellows who do this and do it so brilliantly talk about uh, some of the art in your craft and some of your fellow colleagues who write it. And I, I know that you consider that there are sort of rules of the game, an ethical rule that, that for good science fiction, it's got to be scientifically possible and scientifically accurate. Well, as here you're getting the old argument of what is the difference between science fiction and fantasy, and no one's ever decided exactly where the dividing line is, because um, even things which at one time seem to be fantasy have become science fiction. I've got a sort of working definition that if it... Uh, could possibly happen, and it's science fiction. If it couldn't possibly happen, and it's fantasy, perhaps the best known example of fantasy are the, the Tolkien, the Lord of the Rings. They're really f fairy tales. But if it's science fiction, it must have a basis in known fact or extrapolated fact, possible facts. Well, how can you say what are facts, though, uh, Arthur, it seems to me that man has to project his knowledge beyond what he even knows today. I mean, we say that something is possible, but that's only because it's possible within our own ken uh, at this moment. That's true. The, the outer limits we can never be sure of, but one can look ahead of, of what we're doing now and say, well, obviously, if you've done this, then in a few years we'd better do so and so. This is the position of space flight uh, 10 or 20 years ago. The theoretical basis was there, we knew it was only a matter of time that if these ideas were exploited, that we could go to the moon and the planets. And now we're seeing the proof of this. Speaking of going to the planets uh, beyond, uh, beyond the moon, we are now quite sure, thanks to our unmanned uh, tours of the moon with Surveyor and, uh, and lunar orbiters and the, and the Russians' experience in their unmanned flights, and now man has eyeballed it with Frank Borman's Apollo 8 flight, and these fellows will on Wednesday. Uh, we know that it meets pretty much what we expected it to be. That really, there haven't been any surprises yet, have there? No, but there will be. I mean, we have a, a whole world here, as big as Africa, it took us a long time to explore Africa. We've just looked at the surface. When we start digging, when we start really exploring, we're going to have many surprises. This is inevitable. Let's talk a minute about uh, one uh, anomaly which has showed up uh, that I don't know whether it was forecast in advance. It may very well have been, and I'm just simply not aware of it. I don't pretend to be uh, a scientist in this matter. Matter of fact, my, my, uh, my freshman uh, physics teacher, uh, I'm sure is called Whirling Charlie today, <laughs> over the idea that I'd even be, even be talking to you about such a subject when I couldn't figure out how a pulley works. But the, uh, uh, and I decided not to be a mining engineer because of that. But the, uh, 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 did we have any idea about these mass cons before that? And let me say what they are first for those who may not be uh, even as acquainted as uh, I with my limited knowledge. The, they are mass concentrations, mass concentrations of something uh, which seems to have a magnetic effect of some type. Gravitational. Uh, yeah. On the, uh, uh, the flight of the unmanned and even the Apollo 8 
uh, at 69 miles altitude around the moon has been affected by something in the moon's surface so that it is almost a kind of a, a bumpy a flight, a five or ten foot. Now, that's not very much at 69 mile height uh, difference uh, as they pass around in, in the moon's orbit. And the theory is that these are masses of something below the surface, uh, probably possibly iron deposits, I gather, brought there either by residue in the, the seas, if they were seas, or perhaps meteorites uh, impacting on the moon, burying themselves, that are causing a magnetic uh, effect of some kind. I gather it's as if you were walking with uh, lead shoes across, or, or steel shoes on the cross a... Uh, across a surface that have magnets in it. Is that the idea? Well, uh, it's not actually a magnetic effect. It's a, it's a gravity effect. And the people and the uh, in the spaceship, you wouldn't feel anything. But in fact, when you analyze the orbit of the spacecraft, you find that instead of being a perfectly smooth ellipse, there are these slight deviations, which uh, are important from the navigational point of view, obviously. And therefore, we have to analyze them. And the discovery of these um, concentrations of matter, mass cons, it is of great importance because it will throw light on the origin of the moon. And there's the same things occur on the Earth. The Earth's gravitational field is not absolutely uniform. Now, these may be due to he heavy deposits of, of ores, for example. The obvious uh, idea is they could be very large meteorites uh, that, that made the so-called seas on the moon because, in fact, they
Houston, uh, we can see the 4B now. Roger. Uh, out of which window, Tom? Hatch John's looking at it out the hatch window. Roger. 